Welcome to the first in a four-part series. This program is called Kicking the Kaiser, Anti-Germanist in World War I. The second series is called The Killer, about the flu pandemic of 1918-1919 that took up to 50 million people's lives worldwide. The third program is called The Klan, America's White Cancer, and the fourth is The Cow War, Midwest Former Rebellions During the Great Depression. All of these are different stones in a larger social mosaic, reactionary social movements in America's heartland, 1914 to 1934. This presentation could also be called Kick in the Krauts because ultimately this is a story of racism, although discriminatory actions based not on skin color, but one's ethnic background. We have chosen as the opening frame for this program on anti-German in World War I. This slit screen the German Imperial Army flag in the top left of German World War I and the American stripes of our flag in the lower right to symbolize German Americans' torn allegiances or their ambivalence before April of 1917 when the U.S. joined a world war already in progress. German Americans often felt quite conflicted and this program will explore why and how many of them suffered because of their ethnic origins. If we take Hispanics today and divide them into Guatemalan Americans, Mexican Americans, Cuban Americans, and others, the larger ethnic group in the United States is still German American descended people. Every fifth American has German ancestry. And in the Midwest, that becomes two out of five. That's certainly true in Iowa, where I'm from. And in many Iowa communities or Wisconsin towns or little North Dakota prairie settlements, it's often four or six out of ten. So many Midwesterners have German ancestry. How could it be then that the largest ethnic group in the United States, in the era of World War I, by far the largest ethnic group, could be so demonized? That was a process. But understand the backstory of that process, we need to talk about German Americans in the United States at all. Anti-German feeling wasn't something new in the early part of the 20th century. Already Benjamin Franklin, one of the leading weights behind the formation of the new Young Republic, complained, why should the Germans be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion? This was the opening of a larger text he wrote, which I encourage viewers to find and continue to read because one of our, quote, founding fathers also reveals himself in his text to be rather racist. That part of his continuing letter then goes on to say, which lands me to add one remark that the number of purely white peoples in the world is proportionally very small. He goes on at great length to talk about the dangers of having non-Anglos settle in the English colonies. But that you can research on your own. So already there was anti-German sentiment in the colonies, but I would propose a lot of it had to do with jealousy. The Germans were thriving. They, they came to Pennsylvania, originally a Quaker colony in the 1680s, and right away they took leading positions. Therefore, you have settlements like Germantown, a suburb of Philadelphia today, where there were many German Americans. And this is really the birth of the Midwest, although technically Pennsylvania is a mid-Atlantic state. Why is it that the German settlers came to the northeast of the United States and then went mostly west and settled north of the Ohio River? There's a reason. This map of the 1870s shows that they especially were concentrated in southeast Wisconsin, along the Ohio, along some of the Great Lakes, along the upper Mississippi. Why? Were there almost no, or at least very small, German settlements south of the Ohio River in Dixie? We see that there was a small belt in Texas coming over in the 1830s, and there were pockets elsewhere, like Stuttgart, Arkansas, oddly enough, a rice growing region. The answer is because the German settlers, largely as a group, loathed slavery. They had just left a country which tried in the 1840s to depose their kings and princes and to set up a democracy. But the revolution of 1848 failed. Some of its leading minds fled, like Carl Schurz. He came to first to Wisconsin, later lived in Missouri. He was at one time Abraham Lincoln's secretary, his attaché to Spain. Schurz later became the first non-American-born senator of the U.S. Senate. He was a great biography in his own right, but he's mostly forgotten today by other than academics. But his wife's work is known by everyone. If you ever attended a kindergarten, you're actually attending the modern legacy of Margarita Schurz's work. She began the first one, German-speaking, in Watertown, Wisconsin, 1855. She's then the one who brought kindergarten in its current form to the United States. If we look at the 
map the United States by counties east of the Great Plains, we see that even today the largest German American percentages of the total population is still above the Ohio River and especially concentrated in the upper Midwest. Some white supremacists like to say that the southern counties in the United States have lower rates of savings, of health insurance coverage, higher rates of obesity, unemployment, etc., etc., etc. They blame this often and largely on African Americans, but I would point out that actually that's the part of the country with the fewest German Americans, and I'll let the audience come up with its own conclusions what actually would be the cause of this. At any rate, when the Germans arrived here at Castle Clinton, before one or two Ellis Island, they had to set about finding a place in this new country. I would like to offer three biographical case studies of how German Americans helped settle the country, how German Americans helped set up the quote American dream by pursuing careers and becoming well established in the American middle class, and thirdly, by German Americans chasing opportunities. I start with my mother's people, the Tramses, Heinrich and Maria, her great grandparents, who came with their three sons, Heinrich, Christian, and Hermann, so Henry, who became known as Chris and Hermann. My great grandfather is the one with the check on his shoulder. And in this country, there was the little daughter, Maria or Mary, who was born, and this was the Trams family from which my mother's people are descended. They left their little village of Kroslin on the Baltic coast and literally followed the winds by ship all the way to Milwaukee. Milwaukee, as well as Cincinnati, St. Louis, St. Paul, Minnesota, Columbus, and other Midwest cities had high, high percentage of German settlers. Christian, or Chris, as he now was known, got a job on the railroad and soon rose in the ranks to become a train building manager. One day, the family story goes, he set off in search of water for his men. There was a little spring house to the left of the gate of this picture. And of course, as he was getting water for his men, one of the daughters of the house appeared at the well as well. And of course, the two met, fell in love and got married. That was in 1885. Right away after their marriage ceremony, they got in covered wagons and followed the Iron Horse West, which was being built like extending fingers across the Great Plains. Notice that the land brochure on the left from 1881 is in German. There are also tracts published about Western lands to be had in Bohemian, Norwegian, Danish, etc., trying to lure European immigrants, would-be immigrants, to go to the American heartland. The brochure cover on the left shows the same piece of property in, quote, the start of homesteading, the first year, second year, and so on. And it maintains that by the sixth year, you have little Europe on the plains. It wasn't quite like that, of course. The trams are still followed the railroads west. Again, the script is in German, showing the Karte von Nebraska, zeigen die Lage der B und M RR Landereien in der östlichen Hälfte des Staates. They in the covered wagons went out under the Dakota Territory plains. They built a sod house. The groom below the little two-wheeled gig, his bride near the doorway next to Chris's sister Maria in the shorter dress, and to the left his mother Maria and his brother Hermann in the background. The father was to the right of the photo. Together, two generations lived in this house for five years and proved up on the land and then went back east to Iowa. We were part of a larger movement, which we need to talk about the westward expansion. This painting, painted by Johann Gast, later named John Gast, he captured in the 1870s the spirit of America, but we should look at it with more critical eyes. You have this blonde, fair-skinned, almost angel, bringing civilization west with a book under her arm and telegraph cables as she, quotes, chasing out those horrible Indians and wolves and the buffalo and bringing light and enlightenment. This is not an isolated metaphor. This spirit of the 1870s was involved with the rise of nationalism in Europe, Czech nationalism, Hungarian nationalism, German nationalism, I would argue later Zionist nationalism. All these movements arose sort of parallel in that period, 1870 to 1900, all had their consequences. And all of them basically said that each of those nationalities has something unique and special and should be protected and promoted. The bridge in the background in this painting is the Brooklyn Bridge, which didn't yet really exist. It was only planned, built by Johann Röbling from Turingen, a German. My father's people, the Lewicks, for their part, had left Stuttgart in the province of Swabia and in the 1850s took their covered wagon to what became Belmont, Iowa, and they wrote letters back home to Michigan saying to their relatives who didn't go further, we stand in the doorway of our cabin and watch the buffalo cross the Iowa River in the evenings along with the elk. Metaphor today would be if one were to move to Africa and to write home to the folks back in the Midwest, oh, we're living here in Southern Africa, and at night we watch the zebras and the giraffes and elephants crossing the plains. It was that exotic that these German settlers had left the old world and found this strange, interesting, and exciting place in the new. That was short-lived, though, because these settlers made quick work of the bison. For example, here are simply skulls of the buffalo, not the whole carcasses, and those would be ground up into fertilizer 
The future U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt was one of thousands who went west on Pullman cars and would sit with a shot glass of some fine liqueur and between shootings have a little refreshment while whenever they spotted buffalo herds would simply shoot out the moving train windows and fell hundreds of thousands of buffalo in a week just for sport. Of course, the Native Americans were crying this whole time because a buffalo for them had special and spiritual significance as well as practical use. Once the area was settled, how did people like my grandfather, Grandpa Trams, how did we use what had been prairie grass? Well, we still grew grass. Corn is a kind of grass. And while we had put up fences around our corner of the prairie to keep out any ghosts of buffalo, we were trying to keep the cows in. We too lived from the tall grasses of the prairie, just a different way, in a European way. That's the end of the tram story, which embodies the experience of millions of German immigrants who helped settle the country. The second case study is about the Lewicks, who embody the institution building that German Americans contributed to. If we look at Essling in the 1830s, when my father's people left a century before Hitler, what was then Swabia or in German Schwaben, not yet Germany, we find that the Lewicks had applied for several years in a row to emigrate. We Americans think that all these European immigrants just got up and went to the coast and sailed off from America. That's not quite right. The Danes, as well as many of the German people, had to have permission to leave. They couldn't just go. They still were living in a late feudal period, and they had to have someone sign off that they weren't leaving lots of debt, and they actually could leave in good standing. Same is true as this. <laughs> Once the Lewigs got permission to leave Eich, or Esslingen, they followed other Germans and the ads touting going to the Midwest, to, in this case, Michigan. The Lewigs then, in the spring of 1833, left behind the Germany that they knew as Bad Cannstatt, across the river from Stuttgart. They made their way to Le Havre in northeast France, where they caught the ship called the France and made their way to the New World. When they arrived in the New World, they reached a country that did not yet include Texas, and most of the Louisiana Purchase was unexplored territory. Arriving in New York, they found America's such a city, a much different world than current New York. The spire toward the middle is that of the Trinity Church, which Washington had attended as early president of this country. That's the head of Wall Street, so we know a very different picture indeed. To the left, one sees the islands that later became Liberty Island and Ellis Island. This is what the Lewigs found. They got off at Castle Clinton. Once they registered, they came to the docks to find steamboats going up the Hudson, past West Point, that white complex on the left. At Albany, they changed from paddle boats into canal boats and made their way to Buffalo, which was then a town of some 8,000 souls. It was really a frontier town. After spending the winter with a brother that already emigrated in Buffalo, in 1834, the Lewis pushed on through the Great Lakes to Detroit, a city that had recently burned and was planned to be rebuilt more on the Grand Avenue plans of Washington, D.C. or Paris. The Lewis were quite lucky to find work on the first railroad from Detroit to what was soon Ann Arbor, but then just a clearing in the woods. This has a great deal to say about what the Germans could do in America that they could not do back in their own Germanic homelands. In 1834, the Lewicks, for example, were able to work on a technology that was cutting edge. These iron horses that pulled cars across the landscape. How many miles or kilometers of railroad were in Germany in 1834? Zero. And yet in Michigan, in the wilderness, they could get a job building a train there. Germany had its first functioning railroad in 1835, a year later. Ann Arbor was still in the Great Woods. It was being cleared. The Lewicks, like tens of thousands of other German settlers that year, made homes in what became known as the Old Northwest. And in Washtenaw County, we see that German areas were marked in this map in red, not including the farms owned by daughters of German immigrants who married Yankees. These are just the farms in Washtenaw County in the 1870s, which were held in the hands of immigrants with German names. Ann Arbor is on the far right, and the Lewicks were living just in the township to the left. There they built a big log cabin, my grandfather's Aunt Maddie's, the woman in the middle with the white buttons. Once they built a home, they cleared more trees and sowed the first crops. Once they had their farm in the embryonic stage, the German settlers turned to other needs like creating schools, some of which people like my mother visited as children. And they set about building the first churches, for example, the Evangelical Lutheran St. Matthew's Church in Chicago, 
The map shows the prevalence of Lutheran churches in the 1850s. Of course, the Midwest is mostly frontier at that point, but the density of Lutheran churches was highest where the Germans settled. And even the first Jews in the United States and what became the United States came in the colonial period from Bohemia. They were German-speaking Czechs, if you will. This is a photo of Orthodox Jews in the United States at the time of the Civil War, one in Union uniform, the other in Orthodox dress. In Ann Arbor, the Lewig brothers Gottlieb and Gottlieb, they were two cousins of my line, said about setting up the first businesses. For example, they had a millworks. As in Germany, the owners of the factory, here one of them in the doorway, the other brother in the lower right, worked with their sons, also in the photo, and their staff. In many German enterprises, the owners lived either on site or nearby, and it often happened that their employees also lived in company-owned housing. This was a German tradition in Germanic areas, and this can be found in places like St. Paul, Minnesota where there's still to this day the owner's big mansion on the grounds of one of the German breweries. When the Lewicks 20 years later left Ann Arbor and took a covered wagon in the 1850s to Iowa, they became wealthy in banking and in beef, at least the other side of the family, my branch not. And almost like the Italians or others, the, the Germans still moved in family patterns, but without all the crime. It was paramount who you knew and who you related to, and Germans were very community minded not so the British farmers, British settlers. They were much more individualistic and supported fewer communal projects like cooperative grain elevators and cooperative insurance associations, things like that. Those were really German-driven or at least Scandinavian-driven. And of course, where you have all those farms, businesses, churches, and schools, you need newspapers to communicate. There were over a thousand German-American, German-language newspapers in the United States in that period. And they brought with them as well, Biergarten, which the Anglos despised and thought it was very contradictory to the gospel for Germans to go after church services and have a beer, where they might enjoy brass music. John Philip Sousa, one of the greatest 19th century American martial music conductors, was half German, half Portuguese. And many of the later glee clubs and choral societies came from German-American initiators, like this Milwaukee German men's choir. Germans were also keen setting up sports associations like the Turnerverein here in St. Louis, and this is the 18th 50s, early 60s. Another example would be the German-American baseball team in Milwaukee. Of course, these people had to have places to practice and to gather. Here's the German-American Turnhalle in Davenport, Iowa. The Turnhalle was later destroyed. Many of them fell victims of anti-German state in World War I, but you can still find either active Turn associations in New Ulm, Minnesota, or at least the buildings in Muscatine, Iowa, and other places. Uh, the Turnverein at one point was a very large gymnast association across the United States, now mostly evaporated. There are a few skeletons left of large and thriving German-American community. For example, in New York City, in Gramercy Park area, which was once called Klein Deutschland, Little Germany. Here, for example, in the left part of that building is the Freie Bibliothek Leserhalle, the free library reading room, now part of the New York City metro library system. And the right two-thirds of that building, with the bust up above of German literary and scientific figures, was the German dispensary. Scheffel Hall was built based on the sample of a building in Heidelberg Castle. It was a beer garden and restaurant where many German fraternal organizations met and later housed other German projects and social services. And then there's also still the Deutsche Amerikanische Schützengesellschaft, which is the German American Shooter Society. If we look at the top of the building, we see one of their emblems, Einigkeit macht stark, which would be unity makes you strong or makes us strong. But these are only skeletons, the brick and mortar remains of a culture that's almost all disappeared, extinct. Some German-American influences that are not extinct but are basically uncredited would be the American form of celebrating Christmas. If you read Charles Dickens' Scrooge, British Christmas was very different than Germanic Christmas. In fact, the Puritans poo-pooed Christmas celebrations as ungodly and, and over the top, whereas the German settlers already in the colonial period brought with them the customs of lighted trees and presents and special foods. And the whole business of Easter celebrations with the dyed eggs and the pagan originated chicks and bunnies all came from the German settlers, not the Anglo ones. Our third biographical case study involves this experience of a family that everyone knows. The patriarch of the clan was Friedrich, who was trained a barber in the Rhineland and came from Karlstadt near Mannheim in the 1880s. He made his way across the ocean to New York, where he soon was involved in the hotel industry. In fact, he went west to Seattle and to Alaska during the gold rush and had hotels and provisions companies where he supplied would-be miners in the Klondike with all that they would need. But don't be misled. Those elegantly furnished private boxes weren't boxes, and those ladies weren't ladies. The um, boxes were basically beds separated from each other by hanging sheets on cables, and the ladies were women of the night, all provided by Friedrich, who made a lot of money by night and by day would send those miners out in the fields looking for their fortune, well supplied with everything they might need. 
Having become very wealthy, he returned about 1900 to Karlstadt to find himself a bride. Well, he found one and was going to stay in Germany, but the local Bavarian prince discovered that Frieda was back and said, if you don't leave, I'll put you in prison because you skipped out 20 years earlier without doing your military service. Friedrich and his new bride then came back to the United States. Here's his application for a U.S. passport. And the family became very well-known and wealthy, dealing in New York real estate. That is until 1918 when Friedrich died of the misnamed Spanish flu, which really came from Kansas. You know this family because Friedrich Sr. was the father of Fred Jr. And Fred Jr. is the father of our president, Donald Trump. That's the story of the Trumps. And they embody how German Americans sought careers in the new world, often with great success. But all the success in the world can crumble in an instant if you're no longer in the in-group or the out-group. Already in the middle of the 1800s, Mark Twain sailed up the Mississippi from Missouri past Iowa to Minnesota, and he wrote later in his book about his travels on the Mississippi how the German settlements all flourished, that as soon as you went north and went past a German settlement, there were houses being built and mills and shops, and he admired the Germans' hard luck. Well, indeed, the German Americans in the Midwest thrived. Most of the big breweries were all in German hands. Pabst, Müller, which became Miller, Kor, which later changed its name to Kors, different spelling, Budweiser, Anheuser Busch, Pabst, Leidenkugel, those were all in German hands. The Germans also thrived in lumbering and milling, for example, Weyerhäuser, or Weyerhäuser, we would say, and the Mussers of Muscatine and Davenport. These were fortunes built on brewing, on lumber and grain, and the Germans doing as a group very well. But while they might be involved with local politics, local policies that affected their lives, they were reticent to run candidates at state level levels, and certainly at national levels. So here, the Puck magazine asks, how will our German American vote? Indeed, that's the good question. The German Americans are becoming very rich, and yet lived in a kind of self-imposed isolation, which they enjoyed in Tell, the Zimmerman Telegram. The Zimmerman Telegram is a story of German arrogance and stupidity when the Kaiser's government sent a coded telegram to the Mexicans, offering, if you will join us in a war against the United States, when we win, which we will because we're Germans, you can have back half the country that the Yankees stole from you in the 1840s. The Mexicans desisted, and this telegram by April of 1917 was finally revealed by the British to the U.S. government. They were slow because they didn't want the Germans to know they'd deciphered their code. Upon its release, the telegram was a pressing reason for the United States to join in the war. And once it did, everything changed overnight, German Americans. It changed because the nation had full mobilization. The United States had not experienced full mobilization since basically the Union had mobilized during the Civil War at great expense. The mobilization was hated by most people. Irish Americans in New York resisted it. In fact, it led to riots for several nights in 1863, where many Irish American immigrants chased blacks through the city. Many died on, on both sides. In World War One, everyone had to serve the military projects somehow. Young women in the Red Cross wrapping bandages, farmers producing to the hilt far beyond their normal capacity, factory workers working long shifts. Everyone now had to fight the Hun, as it was said. Now, how do you get the majority of Americans of German ancestry to be willing to work over time and then send their sons or husbands or cousins to Europe to shoot at their relatives? Well, you have to install a huge and pervasive propaganda machine. This document embodies that exact project. The very thought of Germany and of Germany's past and future must be made so odious, so so disagreeable, and hateful to all decent human beings that the word German will for generations come carry the meaning of all that is vile and inhuman wherever heard. What did I say earlier about how the majority minority population in the United States became vilified and demonized in World War I? It was through this. If you follow this letter to its conclusion and go through and exchange every reference to anything German to Hispanic, Jewish, Irish, gay, etc., it's hate speech. And it was hate speech cultivated by the Committee for Public Information, a government-sponsored propaganda machine, interestingly, including women. Even though they couldn't yet vote, the government was wanting to use women in its efforts to psychologically influence Americans' perceptions of the war and their role in it. There were other quasi-official, quasi-private projects. For example, Charles Ort, and I have to wonder if his name might have been Karl Ort, because oh, it's a very German name. He was the head of the National Security League. It also had as its goals to awaken the entire country to service and to fight the Huns, the misnamed moniker given to the Germans. The National Security League had its own button, which looked rather amateurish, but its goals were very clearly focused. Again, it's President Charles Ludeker, but obviously Ben Karl Ludeker. Here you had German-Americans fanning anti-German hate. 
The American Defense Society had offices and operations in Europe behind the front here in Lille in France. Iowa's own Herbert Hoover, the Quaker born future president, was involved with the organization and helped to gather garments, blankets, shoes for supposedly men, women, children, civilians behind the lines. The American Protective League went further than the other organizations. Its badge looked accordingly more professional and serious. It actually sent volunteers and agents into public spaces to basically eavesdrop on neighbors like here. Frau Graupner, the daughter of a German-American captain whose own daughter was married to a police officer. She was overheard in a San Francisco cafe, arguing for peace at any price and extolling German accomplishments in science, literature, art, etc. Then you have the likes of J. Edgar Hoover, as far as I know, not any relationship to Herbert Hoover. He was only 22 years old at the time and had the idea that would, of course, catapult his career forward of deporting German-Americans and instigated a huge dragnet to capture, for example, German sailors in port when we ended the war or others here working on business or in academics. They were rounded up and sent to Hoboken, New Jersey, where they were then put on ships and sent back to Germany. But that wasn't enough. Hoover also wanted to intern German-Americans and help bring several thousand German Americans to three camps in Georgia, North Carolina, and Utah. Who was in those camps? They certainly helped build the camps, as with later POW camps elsewhere in this country in both world wars. They had to, quote, fence themselves in. See the American Guard in the background with that club? It's not a love stick. These men were prisoners. They weren't just laborers. They weren't certainly paid per se. They built their own barracks. They raised their own gardens. They wanted to eat. They tried to settle in and make their temporary homes as cozy as possible. And they included, seriously, 29 members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which has its own story. In an area that not yet had radio, in an era when most middle-class families either had a piano in their homes or they wanted one, music was either self-made. Many people's family members could play a violin or a guitar or some other instrument, or they could sing. And if you didn't want to make your own music, the other options were to go to opera houses, either small Main Street opera houses or the big ones, or to performance halls. The Boston Symphony Orchestra being one of the most important ones in the United States already then. It was built on the reputation of Karl Mook, who came in 1906 from Berlin. He was a bit of a diva director. He was the German Kaiser's favorite. At the time when he came from Berlin to Boston, he had been the director of the opera house in Berlin. He knew how to get friends in high places like that of Miss Gardner in New York, who was a New York socialite and who defended him in later controversies, which spelled his downfall. Mook had been brought by Henry Higginson, who already then, as an older entrepreneur, invested a lot of his own private money in building the Boston Symphony Orchestra, literally on the reputation of German classical directors and composers, and later on Mook himself. Mook created a large symphony orchestra with a huge complimentary choir and the whole staff to make one of the most impressive classical music projects in the Western Hemisphere. However, this also ignited the envy of those who didn't appreciate this project. Karmuk then was picked up in March of 1918 by federal agents, questioned and then sent to infamous internment camps, that being Oglethorpe, Georgia. He was sent there really on the premise that the orchestra wasn't patriotic enough. It didn't play the national anthem before its performances, when in actuality his patron Higginson had not relayed that request to him, nor had the symphony's manager. They didn't want to bother the great director with such American politics, and this earned him the anonymity of many Americans who called for him to be locked up, including Theodore Roosevelt, former president. One of the corporals behind this story was John Ratham, the publisher of the newspaper in Providence, Rhode Island, who was pushing for Mook to play the national anthem before their next concert in Provincetown, uh, in Providence, again, which Mook knew nothing about. And when he didn't play the United States national anthem before the program, there was an outcry. And that only fed his being followed by agents, including this man, an Austrian, who dug deep into Mook's private life to find any excuse to arrest and then to intern the renowned German director. The agent dug so deep as to uncover an affair between Mook and one of his soprano singers, Rosamund Young, specifically letters between the two, which were rather damning, about Mook's low esteem for some aspects of life in the United States and his fondness for the German Kaiser. The affair was then brought to the notice of his wife, Anita, who stayed with Mook, and yet it caused a great deal of suffering for many people. 
Mook's wife was not interned, but she was rounded up in June of that year. And the Mook's private effects were seized by the government looking for any documentation of disloyalty. None was really found, and it was all a ruse. Here, by the way, is the orchestra's manager, Charles Ellis, who, according to the arrest card, says he tried to protect her from the cameraman and the crowd which surrounded the police station where she had just been registered. In addition to Carl Mook, there were 29 orchestra members who were also interned. And one has to ask, were they all really? disloyal and security threats in the United States were ever a good question. It was in this time of hysteria, for example, this is a Connecticut paper coming out just the time the United States joined the war, that anything German was suspect. The Mandelkor club's flag was destroyed, as we see in the second column from the right. What the article goes on to tell about it wasn't just their flag was vandalized, but the whole building was set on fire. The headlines give buffet of impressions. Masked men discovered at railroad bridge. U.S. vessels abandoned by crew under U-boat fire. So hysteria was thriving, and it was fanned by the likes of Jonathan Rathen, the province, Thomas Rhode Island newspaper editor, who wanted to sell newspaper copy at any price, even if it meant ruining people's lives and careers. There were serious proposals to put a fence around Wisconsin to, quote, lock in all those disloyal German Americans out in the Midwest. Uh, one has to ask if that had happened, how far the fence would have gone. You'd have to include much of Minnesota, Iowa, and the Dakotas. The government didn't set up a wall building program in that period. A century later, yes, but then not. Instead, it relied on propaganda to fence in the German Americans. Immediately after the U.S. had declared war, local governments, civic organizations, and even ordinary citizens began an attack on German Americans and their culture. There are children who are instructed by their teachers to cut German songs out of the music books that they use in their classrooms. There is a public stein-breaking fest at one point to keep people from drinking German beer. There's even in one town in Ohio a really gruesome slaughter of German dog breeds. But it's important not to let these ridiculous stories to overshadow what is really a wholesale destruction of an ethnic culture in the United States. Germans were pressured to stop playing German music, to stop going to German plays. And when I say Germans, I mean German Americans whose ancestors might have been in this country since before the revolution. The anti-German hysteria even extended to the federal government. The CPI published an article with tips on how to identify people who were pro-German. The president issued a decree that made any German living in the United States register as an enemy alien. Almost 500,000 men and women were photographed, fingerprinted, and interrogated about their loyalty to the United States. The program was administered by a 22-year-old member of the Department of Justice, J. Edgar Hoover. By the fall, a new series of camps capable of housing thousands of people had sprung up in Utah, Georgia, and North Carolina. Not to train new recruits, but to imprison anyone that the government considered a threat to its security. There was tremendous pressure on new immigrants to conform. To have American flags, to sing American songs. We welcomed you here. Now you're here, you're with us, and you're only with us. Even before the United States entered the already waging World War, there were questions, are hyphenated citizens good Americans? It wasn't just aimed at the German Americans. There were pressures from the Anglos for Hungarian Americans, Czech Americans, Iranian Americans, any American who wasn't an Anglo to stop hyphenating their names. There was a campaign to stop hyphenating, the anti-hyphenization campaign. 
joined in by the likes of former President Teddy Roosevelt, who said no to hyphenate is to be treasonous. There was a campaign to change the name of places in the United States that had anything Germanic in their titles. For example, Germania, Iowa was renamed as Lakota, Iowa. Any town with names or words like Berlin, Bismarck, Germania were suspect of being renamed. The German-American pastor in Berlin, Iowa, was literally taken out while preaching German from the church, traded up and down the streets, and humiliated and made to sing patriotic songs and carry the U.S. flag. Berlin, Iowa is now Lincoln, Iowa. How was this hysteria fed in a time before radios and social media? Well, the new technology of moving pictures was a big force. G.W. Griffiths, who was the creator of The Birth of a Nation, which fanned the spread of the KKK in the 1920s, cut his teeth in World War I on another kind of propaganda, the anti-German his film Hearts of the World had an American hero who got somehow behind the lines and met the young peasant girl played by Lillian Gish. They fell in love, of course, and then he fled when the Germans approached, as shown in this cut. It wasn't just the new technology of moving pictures, but also sheet music. Again, every middle class family either had a piano in the living room or aspired to one. And one of the quickest ways to spread certain ideas was to publish sheet music like this. While there was pressure to step in line to change the name of communities, there was also pressure to change the name of everyday words in American English. For example, sauerkraut became renamed as Liberty Cabbage. Dachshund became named Liberty Dog. Hamburger steak was now Salisbury steak. Even the measles were called Liberty Measles, which is rather absurd. Delicatessens, or special food joints, like this one characterized under the ownership of Johann Schmidt. He's now John Smith, and his wares all have Anglo equivalents of his former German specialties. Even the dog has been swapped out for a beagle or something like a terrier. And then there was the pressure aimed at individuals who were tarred and feathered. We look at it in a comical way, but it had very real and serious examples of people like Johann Mainz twice being kidnapped by local men tarred and feathered for supposedly not being patriotic enough and not buying enough war bonds. He later took his assailants to court and lost. The judge determined that Mainz hadn't been patriotic enough and the men were justified in torturing him by pouring molten minerals on his skin and then throwing feathers on top. This wasn't an isolated case. There were other examples, at least such assaultants were, quote, humane enough to put the hoods on some people to keep the molten rock off their victims' faces. And then there were cases of beatings and even lynching, like that of Robert Paul Prager, a Dresden baker who came to East St. Louis, Illinois in 1905, took up mining, and was rumored to be not patriotic enough. A crowd of 300 assembled and beat him as they walked him over a mile to a hill where they hung him on the way to his makeshift gallows. One of his assailants let him sign a note to his parents. Liebe Eltern, ich muss an diesem den vierten ab 1900 Achsen sterben. Bitte bete für mich, meine lieben Eltern. Dear parents, I must on this, the fourth day of April 1918, die. Please pray for me, my dear parents. Eleven of his assailants were actually indicted in his murder. And what's interesting is what the caption to this paper reads later in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Eleven men who were accused of killing Robert Paul Prager. They went on trial in the Madison County Courthouse in Edwardsville, Illinois, on May 28, 1918. The jury acquitted them after 45 minutes of deliberation on June 1st. They are shown here in front of the courthouse on May 15th as jury selection began. At far left in front is Wesley Beaver, who also was accused of helping to drag Prager from a hiding place in Collinsville City Hall on the night of the lynching. Second from left in the back row is Joseph Riegel, known as the German-American name, alleged ringleader. At far right in the back is their escort, Sheriff's Deputy Vernon Coons. Seven months after the verdict, a guilt-ridden Beaver killed himself. Who were these men who took it upon them to mete out, quote, justice to Robert Paul Prager? 
probably what some German called Stinknormale Burger, everyday run of the mill citizens. Again, the phenomenon is sometimes portrayed in a comic way, but it's not very funny. The consequences were often deadly. Here you have three German Americans known as the wooden shoes and the sign, if this town goes dry, us Germans will hang together. And the closed brewery in the background refers to the phenomena that especially Angles like to germ blame the German predilection for beer and also other alcohol to social ruin. And the so-called Huns were seen as using alcohol as a weapon to lay America to waste and ruin. Did Uncle Hermann Trams, my great-grandfather's brother, did he sell beer in his little general store in German called a Tante Emmerlädchen? Don't know. But what we do know is that behind those trees was the house where my grandfather was born, the son of Christian Ludwig or Chris Lewis Trams, again, the one with the check mark above his shoulder. By the 1890s, Chris had a family of his own. There's his German-American wife, Lydia. And by 1910, they were embodying the American dream. My grandfather sitting on the porch with his later hosen. Little did my grandfather know but only a few miles from where he was born, in that cottage behind Uncle Hermann's store. They actually gathered up in the spring of 1918 all the German language documents he could find in Little Osage, Iowa. German books, hymnals, textbooks, calendars, maps, sheet music, and publicly burned them in front of the old academy. Here's the ruins of those burned documents. It was an isolated case. There were book burnings of German language materials in Davenport, here in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and the people had the nerve to burn German language literature on the town square in front of the courthouse, which is where justice is supposed to be guarded and meted out. Afterwards, someone proudly wrote in, in chalk, here lies the remains of German in Baraboo High School. And indeed, this reflects regional or even national trend where German was dropped from high school curricula, even from college studies. In many places, one had special permission to study German in an academic environment. There were calls for strict bans on German language across the country, and Iowa's governor, William Harding, was happy to coalesce with this by his proclamation in May of 1918 of what's called the Babel Proclamation. And here are his four reasons for banning all languages to be spoken in public other than English. The reason I find most odious is number four. Really? That even in time before, our government can tell us where we should worship and what language we should use in the conduct of worship? There was some resistance to this move. People wrote and asked, how should we serve communion? In this case, a Lutheran pastor talking about his Swedish immigrant congregants. How would he give them communion when they couldn't do it in Swedish anymore? Mayors wrote, like from Danbury, Iowa, and asked about the signage. What do we do about public documents and signs that are in German? Other pastors, educators, even the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, wrote and said, folks, we need to reconsider this, we need to slow down. We're fighting a war supposedly in defense of democracy in Europe, and yet here at home, there are travesties taking place. The governor prevailed. One of the fruits of his language ban is that very few Americans today speak German or even a foreign language. One Iowa woman, however, did resist, and she complained in a legal suit that her mother was a German immigrant, was elderly, lived down a muddy country road, and she had to call her mother and ask on the phone if she had enough medicine, if she needed any help, because her mother was ill and she only spoke German. The woman won. Generally, however, we all coalesced. Oddly, the Iowa State song, to the tune of O Tannenbaum, survived all of this anti-German hysteria. Other German music and musicians didn't fare so well. The Des Moines Symphony, as well as things across the, this country, stopped playing the music of German or Austrian composers. Oddly enough, though, Mozart wasn't even German, he was Austrian. And German literature, like from the hands of talented Goethe or Schiller, were also dropped from libraries and school curricula, including the works of the Grimm brothers, who were Germans. Little Red Riding Hood, and you weren't even allowed in this Indianapolis school system to tell the story of the Pied Piper in English because it was of German authors. That's a review of the effects of this anti-German hysteria on high culture. What about on lower culture? Well, even this U.S. Army recruiting poster touting the Teufelhunden, the devil dogs, the U.S. Marines. Notice that the dog chasing the German Dachshund is a bulldog. John Bull is the equivalent of Uncle Sam. And why was the U.S. government using a British military symbol on our recruitment posters? Hmm. What did that say about our real loyalties? 
Well, one of the young German-American men to answer the call for recruitment was my grandfather's uncle Henry, here on the far right, behind his father's turned back, my grandfather being the little boy in the front on the far left. Uncle Henry, here shown leading some cultural outing with his brother, mother, sisters, cousins. Uncle Henry fought in Europe two or three times. At least he was sent there two or three times. This is one of his trips, leaving on the Armagh at the end of September 1918, only a month or six weeks before the end of the war. Among Uncle Henry's relics after he died, we found not just this postcard, which refers to context that we don't really understand. Express wagons were simply horse-drawn wagons taking guns and material to the front. But postcard that we did understand was this. Again, we make light of things that are too painful to deal with in a serious way. This looks funny. I'll bring you back some souvenirs from fighting in Europe against the Huns, but notice the pretzel and the sausages and the German Stein, which the Germans don't even call Stein in their language, a beer drinking mug, and the Dachshund with the pointed helmet and perhaps even a German gun. Would any German soldier voluntarily give these things to his Yankee opponent? No. You'd have to shoot and kill. This is the war of the booty of war. This is war booty. Again, we make something whimsical and cartoonish that's actually very serious. We're going to go and hunt the Germans and bring back war booty. There's a deeper story here about the awkwardness German Americans felt about being who they simply were. Here's Uncle Henry as a boy in the first decade of the 1900s or in the teens. He's in the middle. And behind him to our right is my great-grandfather, George Michael Lewick, for whom I was named. At least my great-grandfather, if not his other brothers, were quite charmed by the hateful spouting of D.C. Stevenson, the Grand Wizard of the Klan in Indianapolis. The flourishing of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s across the United States, but especially outside the South, wasn't particularly anti-black. It was anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant. And a lot of it had to do with residual anti-Germanists of just a few years earlier during World War I. Clan spread quickly and widely. Here's the preparation for a parade in my native Mason City, Iowa. And we know from family research that my great-grandfather was in this column. They marched down Federal Avenue and carried a fallen comrade to his grave. Again, a propaganda stunt. In the mid-20s, 40,000 clans, men and women, were wont to march in Washington, D.C. to exercise their so-called First Amendment rights and to flex their political muscles. They did a bit too much of that flexing. All this backed up by rather professional print propaganda, heavily anti-Catholic against the Pope, against Rome, against Catholicism. The Klan would stand up using the ballot to resist papal influence. Here is a Klansman sitting in the big belly of the Pope. There were rumors that the Pope was building a mansion in Washington, D.C. out of gold. And here's the real kicker. A Knights of Columbus members under the tree on the right, phoning others, quick run, the Klan's coming. And the Klan, of course, carrying banners, 100% Americanism and the truth. They would be the great army for truth and Americanism, and they would make Rome tremble. What are other examples of how German Americans either suffered from or responded to the anti-German stereo of World War I? Well, my grandfather, Elmer Trams, the son of Chris the immigrant, he was full-blooded German American and even spoke some German. He took up as his bride, my grandma Irma Trams, who was half German, half Yankee. Her mother, here a little girl on her mother's lap in the 1860s, later became a school teacher in eastern Iowa and later married the older brother of one of her pupils in the Wyndham school where she taught. When she married him, however, her sister Griselda's husband, George Pratt in Anglo, forbade the two to ever meet again because she, quote, married a German. It was only after Griselda's husband's death that the two actually reunited. So there was latent and simmering anti-German hysteria, but it was different. During World War I, it erupted and was officially sanctioned. It was institutionalized, not just something that occurred on private levels. When my grandparents married in August 1918, it was toward the end of World War I. They quickly set up on the farm near Mason City, where I grew up. They should have been focused on the business of raising food for the war effort. They had their first livestock. They had an Anglo-hired hand, Harold Hunt. And they had good yields, which they could contribute to the farm production campaigns the government kept pushing. And despite his being needed on the farm to sow the seeds of victory, my grandfather felt obliged to go to Missouri to a military camp and to volunteer to fight in Germany and luckily was rejected because of flat feet. In World War II, my fully German American grandfather forbade Aunt Eleanor, here in the back right row, to date Helmut Zolke. But after the war in the 1950s, Gramps didn't hesitate to profit by selling chicken feed to Helmut Zolke and his eventual bride.
Donald Trump's family told people after World War II that they were Swedes because they were afraid of offending Jewish apartment or home buying customers if they said the truth that they were actually German Americans, although the mother was a Scottish immigrant who came at the age of 18 in 1930. Still, the Trumps maintained this for many decades until a Swedish town wanted to open a museum about them and they had to admit, well, actually, we're not Swedes at all. These are just examples of how during a time of war, when the nation had identifiable enemy, those at home had to be marginalized had to be bad-mouthed and, and supposedly contained. Anything to do with Germany was embodied in the Kaiser here being strung up again, a lynching by Uncle Sam. On a pedestrian level, we had to keep anything German from our children to take all things Germanic, whether it be language or literature or music from the school systems. And we all knew that in private, German Americans were actually pro-German, even if in public, for example, in this cartoon, they'd wave the American flag because, as we were told, all things German threatened civilization and had to be resisted.